I'm going to talk about why the banks, which are even bigger now than they were before the crisis, should be made a whole lot smaller in order to keep from having another crisis or basically what I consider to be a second leg of this particular crisis. <coughs> There's an old uh, Russian proverb that says, when money speaks, the truth is silent. And um, that is really a lot of the principle that goes on between um, Wall Street and Wall Street lobbying and Washington and the administration and Congress, and it doesn't matter what party um, is, is in power and, and, and who is the Treasury Secretary, there seems to be a consistent message, which we've heard louder and clearer after this past crisis that began, well, manifested in, in the fall of last year, but began far um, way, way before that, um, and has really taken down uh, a tremendous portion of the economy, and yet, we have Ben Bernanke, the Federal Chairman, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, saying that the recession is almost over. We have the Dow at 10,000. We have banks putting out record profits, um, and everything is supposedly really great. Whereas we just went through this tremendous crisis, where they are great because they were given an unprecedented amount of government subsidy, which has never been given nor not to a private sector and, and certainly not to any of the public sectors or the rest of the population. Um, and, and what I want to talk about is just a little bit about how that all worked out and why, therefore, we need to really think about splitting up these banks, reinstating Glass-Steagall, which was a 1933 act, which I'll get into in a little bit more detail, that had segregated banks and made them smaller and less risky to avoid the very uh, possibility of the government stepping in or being asked to step in or choosing to step in um, in order to save a banking system that's inherently flawed. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit and, and sort of touch on some of the things that Professor Harvey said this morning, which, which I found, um, well, all, all of which was interesting, but, but sort of which lead to this. Um, and the idea of what actually caused the banking crisis very quickly. Um, yeah, he talked about the subprime market and how there are certain states in the country in which the subprime market deteriorated by more than in other states. And there are certain cities in which subprime lending and predatory lending was going on way before the media noticed it was a crisis and credit seized in the markets and the banking system almost imploded and, and, and received a whole lot of money in order to keep itself alive. Um, but subprime loans aren't actually as much of the problem. They're just the problem that has been focused on by, by most of the media and, and by Washington and by Wall Street because they like it that way and I'll tell you why. Because subprime loans are a good excuse um, for them not taking responsibility for what the real problem is. And the real problem is what they created on the back of these subprime loans. There was $1.4 trillion worth of subprime loans created in this country between 2002 and 2007. $1.4 trillion. Before that time, um, what was going on in 1999 was a stock market bubble. In 2000, it was still going on. In 2001, bubbles started to burst. Why? Because we started to notice that a lot of the companies that were inside that bubble, like Enron, like WorldCom, like basically the whole energy sector and the whole telecom sector, were basically creating profits out of nothing, but shifting money around, doing a lot of derivatives transactions with Wall Street, creating a lot of debt merging and acquiring and becoming more of, of monopolies in their own little arenas on that debt, and, and posting numbers that were just not true. WorldCom was one of the implosions, one of the scandals um, in 2002 that basically posted $11 billion of complete fraud. Um, Enron, of course, did a lot of more creative things with the fraud that it produced. And you can do that in a market that allows you to create transactions and assets out of absolutely nothing but the idea that someone's going to be around to buy them. Why does the stock market go up? Because people come in and buy the idea that it's going up, and that brings more people in and more people in. And it was very much the same thing with the, the telecom and, and the Enron bust and scandals. And that led to a recession, and that led to the market falling down because it noticed that there was no there there. So all the money came out of those kinds of companies, and all the money came out of the banks that had been funding and working with those kinds of companies to boost up their profits on the back of a lot of fraud and a lot of nothing. And then all of a sudden, Alan Greenspan, Federal, chairman, Federal Reserve Chairman at the time, came in and reduced interest rates from about 6% down to 1.75% in a short period of time between the end of 2001 and the very beginning of 2003. And what that created was a lot of cheap money. Now, the banks always like to take cheap money and churn it as much as they possibly can and create as many assets and 
derivatives and all sorts of funky securities out of this money in order to sell it on and on and on and on. It's like um, the idea is called leverage in, in the banking industry and it's similar to say one of you goes to Vegas and has like a dollar in your pocket but you want to bet a hundred dollars and so what you do is you ask the person next to you if they can spot you a dollar and then you ask another person and another person and another person say <coughs> thirty times or a hundred times to all spot you a dollar that all works out really fine if you win because then you can pay everybody back if you don't win you've not only lost your dollar you've lost all of the dollars that you've received from all of these other people and that's exactly how banking works banking works by the idea of creating something or the illusion of something that can be borrowed against to create this tremendous debt bubble for banks. Now I'm, I'm talking for consumers, but for banks that really was the cause of this crisis because when that debt bubble that was created on the back of those subprime <coughs> loans burst, that's when credit seized, that's when the banks got scared, that's when they ultimately pillaged. And I, I do have a book out called It Takes a Pillage because I couldn't t think of any other word for, for what happened. Um, what became a $19 trillion bailout, I will talk about why it is 19 and not the $700 billion of TARP money that we see publicly was the extent of the bailout. That was nowhere near the extent of the bailout. Um, but what banks did was they took this $1.4 trillion of subprime loans. They pushed the idea of creating these subprime loans because there's no one, there were else to get money from. They were lending out, they were borrowing at, at 1%, 2%, 3%. And, and what they could do at the most is get maybe 5 or 6% from, from prime mortgage borrowers because they kind of knew the deal. The prime mortgage market or the, the more higher quality borrower mortgage market has a certain relationship to where interest rates are. There's only so much you can squeeze um, because of competition, because of public awareness of what interest rates are out of prime borrowers. So the only place to squeeze a lot more money and a lot more interest and a lot more payments coming into the system was subprime borrowers. So although there are predatory loans coming out at the bottom um, of these $1.4 trillion of subprime, it was the demand from the top that said, give us subprime and we will create new securities on the back of those subprime loans such that we will borrow against them, we will trade them, we will create them. And what happened was on the back of that $1.4 trillion, the banking industry created $14 trillion or 10 times that amount worth of what became <coughs> toxic assets. Um, and, and the way to do it is all sort of financial mumbo jumbo and moving a lot of stuff around. But it's basically like if you look at you know a, a layer cake or something, and you have the very bottom layer might be you know chocolate and rich and whatever, and that might be the 1.4 of subprime loans, and then everything above it, all the sort of you know sort of vanilla fluff on top of that is the 14 trillion dollars worth of assets that were created on top of it. And the reason the banks could move these assets around is because when they packaged up these subprime and added a lot of fluff to them, they could create demand. Because the idea was, well, the housing market's going up. So even these like lousy subprime schleppy borrowers that we're getting uh, loans from, they're, they're going to either pay or will repossess their homes and will sell them and will make money. So th there will be never any doubt that money will come into the bottom of what I call an upside down pyramid of risk and an upside down pyramid of debt, where that, that little tiny corner at the bottom, the mini triangle, is the subprime loans. The 14 trillion starts to get you up the triangle. And then there's another layer, <coughs> excuse me, there is another layer of debt on top of that 14 trillion dollars worth of assets. And here's, here was the bigger problem. <coughs> what they then took was the 14 trillion dollars worth of assets, 75 percent of which were created in the United States by United States Bank, another 25 percent were created globally mostly out of European banks, sold them throughout the world and borrowed against them. They said, well, we have these assets, these 14 trillion, <coughs> and they're secure. They actually, all these people will either pay back or will get their houses and will get money. These are secure assets. And on the back of that, they borrowed more money. And banks borrowed up to 10 times the amount of money that these assets represented in order to go off and do other things, to, to merge, to acquire, to trade in oil, to do whatever they needed capital for, these assets became sort of that chip on the table to move even further. And the average amount of borrowing done on the back of those 14 trillion was 10 times. Some banks took a piece of that 14 trillion and borrowed up to 30 or 40 times the amount. So actually, it's not the $1.4 trillion of subprime loans that, that Washington and that Wall Street want us to consider is the extent of the problem. It's the $140 trillion worth of stuff and debt that was created on top of that. <coughs>
And the reason banks could do that is because they could use our capital, our money, our deposits, our loans, even subprime interest rates coming in on those loans, and turn it into all of this stuff because they contain them, because banks over the years were allowed to become these, these, these monolithic creatures that could have safe things like our loans and our deposits and our money and speculate on the back of it, create these toxic assets, go into different sorts of trading, speculative activities, and, and, and use our money and our loans as sort of the sure part of it to get there. Um, and that was because banks were allowed to merge after 1999 because the Glass-Steagall Act, which had been created in 1933, was repealed. In 1933, after four years of a Great Depression, um, precipitated by the crash in 1929, and as uh, Professor Harvey indicated this morning, that was precipitated by a real estate crisis and a debt crisis, not with individuals, although foreclosures became at record highs for that period back then, but throughout the banking system. The banking system even then borrowed and speculated on the back of real estate investments that went bad as well. That's, that was one of the primary causes of the 1929 crash. And for four years of economic depression, leading up to 25% unemployment, leading up to bread lines, leading up to record foreclosures and defaults and delinquencies and displacement, we got an act the in 1933 called the Glass-Steagall Act. And that act was predicated on the notion that banks could not be allowed to speculate on the back of individual deposits or individual loans, that it was just not it, it was a cause of the crisis, and it was not going to be a cause of future crises. And on the back of that Glass-Steagall Act was also the FDIC was created, which now backs our deposits. And the reason the FDIC was created to back deposits, and the reason it could work to back deposits, and it had enough money to back deposits on the event that another crisis were to occur, is because banks were segregated into the less risky components that had our deposits and our checking and savings accounts and gave simple mortgage loans and other types of credits to individuals, and completely separate institutions, which were the investment banks, the speculative ones, the ones that traded, the ones that took money and did whatever they did with it. And the government only pledged to back the safe ones, the boring ones, the ones that deal, dealt with consumers, the ones that dealt with the public, which is what a government should do. A government should not be backing bets gone wrong in the rest of the sector. Um, and, and for decades it didn't. And, and for decades we didn't have tremendous crises in the banking industry. We had swipes from lobbyists and from Congress people along the decades at the Glass-Steagall Act, but nothing to fundamentally fully kill it until 1999. And in 1999, there was an act called the Graham leach bliley Act, which is also the Financial Services Modernization Act. They, they sort of stick this word modernization in as if that will somehow uh, make Congress people unable to fight against it, because how do you fight with modernization? How do you fight with progress? Um, and it was passed by a 90 to 8 vote in the Senate. It was a complete bipartisan passage of something that then said, OK, well, let's take all these individual stable checking, savings, credit, loan, interest rate payments type of services. And let's merge them back with all these speculative investment banks so they can now be together and use this real money as capital, as, as, as the seed to create these assets and to sell them and sell them and sell them. The banking industry made $300 billion out of those $14 trillion worth of toxic assets when they weren't toxic just to create them. That didn't even count selling them and trading them and trying to get you know, some little town in Iceland and some little municipality <coughs> in California and some pension fund in Texas to buy them. This was just on the sheer creation. They, they made $300 billion. So there was a tremendous profitability way beyond the idea of subprime loans being created and the lenders making profit, which they also did on the back of those loans, and what the banking industry was able to do because it had access to those loans because it had been integrated in such a way after the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed in 1999. Um, and today, the, uh, the current administration has resolutely discussed many times this idea of too big to fail and how we should regulate these institutions that have been created, not just on the back of the repeal of, of 1999, they don't sort of acknowledge that this was an issue, but even since the crisis period of last year, where the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department and the FDIC had to basically put in over $19 trillion worth of 
bailout and subsidy money. Now that money is now only 14 trillion. Um, they, they put out some programs and took some of them back that were completely extraneous. But 14 trillion dollars to subsidize a system um, is, is pretty big. And incidentally, it's the same amount of money, coincidentally, of the 14 trillion dollars worth of toxic assets that were created. That 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 um, it's not entirely a coincidence, um, of course. But but uh, to some extent, there is a sort of poetism for poeticness for the fact that it's the same number. Um, but there, there's, there's no discussion as to how to make too big to fail smaller. There's no notion that too big to fail is actually too big to succeed. And when it does fail, it takes down the rest of the economy. And the Wall Street system almost did that last year. And the result of their bailout is that the bigger banks that survived the crisis became even bigger and more powerful and more concentrated and more monopolistic the smaller banks that did not receive the same amount of government funding have failed. Um, just <coughs> this week, we closed, the FDIC closed its 106th small institution this year. There are only three closed in 2007, 26 closed in 2008, while the crisis even was hitting the headlines in the fall of last year. And 106 so far closed this year with 416 on the problem list of the FDIC. These are all small banks, credit unions, community banks. They're not the big J.P. Morgan Chases, which received government subsidy to buy uh, when it was about to fail Bear Stearns, which is an investment bank. Again, taking a J.P. Morgan, which has in it investment banks, so has risky and deals with individual types of services, and adding to it another risky investment bank that the government subsidized, um, as well as Washington Mutual, which was more of a bigger dealing with people bank. Um, bank of America is a bank that came out of this crisis bigger, more convoluted, more toxic, more complex. Um, and the government, and this is still being investigated, backed its acquisition of Merrill Lynch, which was about to go under. The government basically looked at, last fall, an institution like Merrill Lynch that literally was about to go under and said, I know, let's, 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 let's add some money behind this institution and merge it into Bank of America, which is an institution that had its own problems but, but wasn't at death's door like Merrill Lynch was, and somehow that's going to create a, a safer, better entity. I mean, it doesn't even make any logical sense. And yet, Congress is, is resolutely not bringing up the idea of reinstating Glass-Steagall, at the minimum, of re-breaking up the Bank of America Merrill Lynch mess. Um, and that was just one of the banks that became more powerful out of this crisis. Um, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were investment banks. They only lived in the speculative part of the world. They don't even, even deal with like regular people, particularly Goldman Sachs. Um, and they, in the midst of last year's crisis, were able to go to the Federal Reserve to somehow get the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and, of course, Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson at the time, who had been a CEO, was very involved in these conversations, as was Tim Geithner, who is the current Treasury Secretary, who at the time was the head of the New York Fed, the closest Fed to Wall Street, were all involved in conversations that basically allowed Goldman and Morgan Stanley to become what is called bank holding companies. And really, that's supposed to be the label for these boring banks. Um, but they got that, so they got access to our money and to government capital and everything else, even though all they had ever done before is nothing really of use to the public and, and no actual transactions with real, mortal, normal people. Um, and, and, and we're able to just receive this money from the government. Um, Paul Volcker, who was a former Federal Reserve Chairman, is the only person remotely near the administration who is vocally talking about breaking up the banks. Again, and, and not even to make them smaller, to make them less risky, to, to, to take the government out of the responsibility that they put themselves into, um, which was a very dumb decision of backing the banking industry as it stands and backing institutions that are more complex than they were before, more powerful and again more concentrated. I mean, every time Volcker says something, the administration kind of shuts him up by saying, no, we're just looking at how we deal with this too big to fail problem. And, and Volcker will say, okay, well, why don't you make them smaller? And they'll be like, what do we do about this too big to fail problem? Make them smaller. Yeah, what do we do about the systemic risk in the system? And, 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 and there's, there's this just sort of lack of um, either understanding or willingness or whatever else. And a lot of that comes from the fact that all these banks who became bigger and more powerful out of this crisis are in Washington like every day uh, lobbying to make sure that there aren't any Congress people who bring up this idea that we should break up the banks and bring back and reinstate something like Glass-Steagall to create more stability going forward. Um, when I, I, I wrote a, a book in 04 after the, the Enron and WorldCom crisis called Other People's Money, The Corporate Mugging of America, and the first chapter in that book was called Bank Wars. 
And it was the idea that the, the most powerful banks, in order to remain competitive, needed deposits, needed asset <coughs> assets, needed access to government subsidies, and that because of Glass-Steagall repeal, they were only going to continue to get more powerful and so forth, and to the extent they were creating toxic assets and dealing in the derivatives markets and doing all the funky things they were doing, this was going to create a crisis if we didn't reinstate Glass-Steagall. And it has created a multi-trillion dollar uh, bailout and subsidy of this industry. That is more than all of our wars. That's three times more than if you take all of the wars, and the United States is involved in a lot of wars, from, from the American Revolution through Afghanistan and Iraq. All of that funding is only a third of the amount that has been made available to the banking industry that doesn't get talked about a lot because it's all on Fed books and New York Fed books, and that stuff is secret. And there are acts that have been um, introduced in Congress to try and get this information to be less secret, but it has not worked yet. So there's all of this money sloshing around, and it's all predicated on the fact that the banks who are in power want to stay in power, want to stay as big as they are, because if they are too big to fail, um, then the government will have to back them. And I think no matter what happens, if we look at the real uh, yeah, just to finish on this, if, if, if we look at the real state of the economy after the banks got all this money and are posting profits and are on track for record bonuses, record, not even better than last year, but record bonuses this year, on the back of all those government subsidies, and you look at the real economy where unemployment is at 9.8 percent and rising, it was at 5.8 percent before the fall crisis, 5.8, that's how much it has increased while all this money was given to the banking sector. Foreclosures this quarter are at record highs, record highs even compared to last fall when they were really bad. Defaults, delinquencies, every type of consumer debt figure you can think of, they are all worse than they were before the crisis. So this part of the economy has dr dropped dramatically. This part of the banking system has increased on the back of federal decisions and government subsidies. Um, and so that's why we really need to focus on changing this infrastructure and demanding, at the very least, that these banks are broken up because that will actually have the benefit of making them more easily uh, able to be regulated. They won't have to require as much federal funding if they fail, and we don't have to back bad bets of banks like Goldman Sachs or of factions of Merrill Lynch or factions of Citigroup, which is a complete mess in itself, and I could go on for hours about Citi. Um, it, we, won't, we, we won't have to do that. There's a couple of senators who are, who are starting to warm to this idea. I actually was in Washington yesterday and Thursday, and I, I spoke with Senator um, Bernie Sanders from Vermont. Um, and his, uh, his, his policy uh, people are, are actively trying to draft legislation to bring back Glass-Steagall. Um, we talked about it on some C-SPAN thing. I don't know when it will air, but, but, but just to you know, bring back that, that notion within the Senate, at least, with, that's where it started first time in, in, in 1933, um, to, to try and just, just break this power, not just because it's powerful, but because it's really expensive to everyone else, and it's very destabilizing. Um, so that's why we need to break up the banks. I'm going to leave it now for questions, and, and just mention that um, I, I do, this book is, is out now, and, and um, it really goes through how that 19 trillion was put together, who said what to whom. Um, there is a book called Too Big to Fail. The, um, Andrew Ross Sorkin has, has written for the New York Times, and it's, it's a fabulous book, but it, it tends to be told from the viewpoint of the people who actually put this thing together. Um, and I don't really care what they said they were thinking. I know what they did, <laughs> and I, I, can tr I, I tracked what money went where and when, um, and what they said on record. And um, it, it's very different from what uh, they want us to think was going on. This, this bailout did not have to happen the way it did. It did not have to be as expensive as it was. So thank you.